Right, and a very good evening to everyone. This is the seventh edition of Montague Island Books, and I'm delighted to say that our guest tonight is a UK native who maintains strong ties to Scandinavia. He's got an undying love of gritty Scandi noir powering the Jamie J Johansson series. Morgan, our guest and I, hopes to produce crime fillers that blend dark and unforgiving Scandinavian settings and crimes with tightly woven narratives, deep characterization, and intense sweeping scenes. Our guest has written across a variety of genres and brings that experience to crime thriller, delivering a unique reading experience and instantly recognizable style. The Jamie Johansson series is as much tribute to his love of Scandinavian crime and thriller as it is an effort to forge a genre for itself. And the author's got high hopes for the series, which will span many years um, and chart the rise and fall of a, of a detective who will hopefully attain the immortal status that the great has. Now, that was the bio from um, Amazon, and I'm delighted to welcome our guest tonight, Morgan Green, also known as Daniel Morgan. Hi, Daniel, are you okay? I'm okay. Thank you very much for the lovely introduction. Very good, and pleased to have you with us. So, do you want to start by telling us a little bit about um, what, what I might have missed off your bio and a little bit about your books and where we can get them, etc.? Sure, of course. Um, so, if uh, those, those with a keen ear will, will no doubt identify that I'm, uh, I'm Welsh as well, as well as being British. And um, the strong ties I, I have to Scandinavia are. In my work, I work as a, as a copywriter for my day job for a Swedish company and uh, been there for a little while now. And, um, and yeah, and I'm very, very friendly with, uh, with lots of Swedish people and, you know, I go there for work and things. So it's a, it's a really great, um, should I say, resource to have uh, that I can, that I can utilise and, and they definitely keep me in line with all my kind of, um, all my descriptions and my translations and things. So it's, uh, yeah, I've got a Swedish editorial team specifically for, uh, you know, that's my claim to fame now. Um, yeah, that's uh, that's kind of the the backstory behind that. My my writing itself has has sort of uh, I've I've always written, um, and I wrote uh, plenty of sci-fi before uh, I started writing crime thriller with uh, a friend of mine who kind of taught me all the ins and outs of self-publishing, and that was kind of really good fun. And after that, I'd run his course, I made the switch to to crime and thriller, and hopefully put my uh, experience to a bit better use. And uh, and here we are. Right. Wonderful. Just out of interest, are, are any of your books out in Scandinavian format, or are they just in English at the minute? Uh, they're only in English, as I'm as I'm an indie, um, pure indie, so I've got no no support from a publisher as of yet. But um, so it's so it's just in English, and um, yeah. Right. But I mean, theory, theoretically, if they were going to be translated, it would be less work to translate it into Swedish because there's there's a couple of lines already in the, the right language. <laughs> And what made you decide to stick as an indie rather than go in, uh, you know, one of the sort of big publishing houses? It's, I mean, it's a, I mean, it's an age-old question, really. And I work, uh, I run a company um, that that specifically kind of tasks itself with the job of of finding up and coming writers and connecting them with with agents and, and publishers and that kind of thing, but. I, I don't know. I mean, I've pitched to a couple of publishers tentatively, sort of, you know, when I first started the series and things. But the the guy that sort of taught me about self publishing that I worked with before, you know, he's kind of done relatively well in the states under a pen name, and he was kind of giving me the ins and outs. And and for me, I just I quite like the idea of kind of keeping control of of the series and, and kind of you know deciding where I can go with it and where I can pivot to. And and you know, and I'm already kind of planning what I'm doing next. And and I, I and I don't know. I just I like the freedom of being able to, to do that and being able to decide for myself. So as time goes on, I'm more and more inclined maybe to kind of stick with the indie kind of, you know, side of things just because I, I quite like maintaining the ability to change direction, change course kind of as and when. Um, but I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be kind of, um, you know, I wouldn't turn my nose up at kind of working with, with a publishing house or, or an agent because at the end of the day, you know, you know, as one person, you can only do so much when you have the support of, you know, a publisher and an agent and that kind of thing behind, you know, there's a lot more people who are helping your book to kind of do better. And at the end of the day, you know, everybody wants their book to be read by as many people as possible. That's why we write. So it's, uh, 
it's I think it's more of a kind of a choice of necessity for now but I'm always I'm always open to kind of you know new options and new possibilities so it's never right. never a, never a signed deal you know <laughs> yeah never the signed deal until you got that signature yeah that's right so just for those um that obviously in bookends a lot of a lot of people know you um you know from from your interaction on the group um and a lot of us have, have sort of read some of your books but for those that may be listening in or watching this on youtube that haven't heard of you before do you want to tell us a little bit about your um you know about your current books and your current series um so yeah um as you as you kind of introduced in the uh, introduction uh, my resident detective is jamie johansson she's a late 30s uh, detective who's come up through the london met uh, her father was um a notorious sort of detective who worked in stockholm in sweden in the 90s uh, until she was moved kind of uh, sort of back to England with her mother then after her parents sort of split up and um, and she kind of followed in his footsteps much to her kind of mother's dismay and the stories kind of unfold in that way where she's kind of trying to you know trying to keep a relationship going with him even though he's he's sort of long long passed away um, by kind of following in his footsteps and, and becoming a detective and the latest book Angel Maker um, it is a story that picks up when uh, one of her father's kind of uh, biggest callers, uh, a serial killer operating in, in, in Stockholm in the 90s called the Angel Maker, uh, he dies in prison. Um, but then two days after his death, uh, another body is found and the kind of the circumstances of the crime very much resemble um, the, the crimes of, of the man who's just died. And with the case files missing and the kind of the details of the, the original kind of murders never released to the public, it sort of begs the question of whether a copycat has emerged or whether they got the wrong man sort of all those years ago. So Jamie's kind of drawn back to, to her home city to kind of solve the, the crime that her father possibly never did. And, um, and that's kind of the premise of Angel Maker. And it's, um, yeah, it's kind of a, uh, a Scandi kind of crime thriller and it's a little bit slow burning but it kind of really hopefully continues to ramp up and snowball towards the end and I really like that kind of um, I feel. love the book I, I love I love reading it with one of them where I didn't want to put it down so it was uh, good, good. Thank you know, very much. It, it was really good so I, I think if I'm right did you write three or was it four books last year uh so yeah I wrote uh, I, I published three and then I wrote Angel Maker then just before I finished that just before Christmas and then it came out then at the end of January so um, on paper three technically four but uh, yeah I'll settle for three three years so the first three were, were from a first series um, and then this is uh, the first one from, from from your second series is that right yeah basically I'm I'm kind of trying to make sure that you know the, the Jamie as you know other detectives kind of you know, would, would sort of progress in her career. So the first three take place in London and watch her kind of tackle her first murder case as a as a young detective sergeant. And she's still got a kind of, you know, glint in her eye and, and she still kind of hasn't had that shine taken off her. And through those three kind of um, prequel novels now, she sort of really comes to terms with the way that, you know, crimes and that kind of thing really affect Sort of detectives and, and shape them so she gets a little bit more cynical and a little bit more kind of um you know rough around uh the edges and, and then yeah at the end of the third kind of prequel book then she takes a bit of time away and then the fourth book then sweeps us back up so it's going to be set like i think triplets of books that are going to be kind of one after another and then a break and then triplets because i just like being able to experiment with transplanting somebody into a new setting and have three distinct stories that are all kind of linked together as well I think with that as well, it, it also means, you know, if, you, if you'd if you like do a series of 10, you think, well, I can't just start at number 10. I've got to go back to number one, where if we're in chunks of three, you, you can maybe think, well, I don't really need to go right back to the beginning. I can just go back to the first in the series. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I, I, I quite sort of like that idea. So obviously in this series, you've just, as I say, released book one. So what is the um, the format or, or, or the sort of the diary outlook for books two and three? Uh, so book two is going to be called Rising Tide, and that's going to be, a bit of a, of a novel experience, hopefully, for the reader. And it's going to see Jamie 
and her new partner called out to a remote uh, oil platform in the Norwegian Sea to investigate a suspicious murder that the oil company are trying to sort of sweep under the rug. So it's going to be a very much like a claustrophobic sort of thriller experience where where they're kind of hunting a killer and the killer's hunting them. Um, that one is mostly written, so it's um, going to be out now at the end of May, hopefully. And then the third one, then I'm probably aiming for an early autumn release uh, in September, uh, which is going to be called Blood Mountain, I think. I'm toying with names, but I think Blood Mountain, and that one's going to be, um, I think, the novel where Jamie finally digs into the crime that was alluded to at the end of the epilogue of, of, of Angel Maker. So if you can, if you know, for the for those in the know who've read it, they'll know what I'm talking about. Oh, that's a uh, one to real people in with, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. I've, I've just seen the cover today, actually. I think you posted it earlier for the second book. Yep. They're like this closed room kind of book, isn't it? Um, and I love the, love the cover, so uh, people can find that on uh, on Facebook and uh, and get prepared for that, uh, for that second one. So just in case people are unaware, how, uh, as you say, we're being independent, etc. how do people get in touch with you as regards uh, website, social media, etc. and can they purchase um, signed copies, etc. from you, directly from you? Sure. So, um, yeah, you can buy, buy my books on both paperback and Kindle um, on Amazon. Uh, they're also available on Kindle Unlimited. And Bearskin is actually available on Prime Reading. So the first one of the prequel trilogy is going to be available on Prime Reading until June for anybody who has Prime Reading. Um, if you want to get in touch with me, uh, I maintain a Facebook page where I post lots of terrible videos of me reading poetry and parts of my books and parts of other books that I like and, and you know, generally waffling on and on and on. Uh, helps get it all out of the system before I come on, you know, real uh, kind of interviews like yeah. this. And, um, and yeah, you can drop me a message there and interact with me there. Or if you'd like to, you can head to my website, which is just simply morgangreen.co.uk, all one word. And you can submit a contact form. Uh, and if you'd like to purchase any signed copies, just, just send me a message on Facebook or on my website and I can sort something out for you. Um, and generally, I just tend to you know, order a, a you know, order a copy from Amazon. I'll sign it and I'll just send it on to you. So you you won't you'll pay what you pay on Amazon if that's if that's okay. Um, and yeah, that's that's it. Simple as I. Uh, hopefully one day I'll have a, pub, a publicity team who will do that for me. One of those stamps with my signature on it. And they can just go stamp a book, stamp a book, stamp a book. But for now, it'll just be me in a pen. Brilliant. So that's so. At least people know how to uh, how to contact you. So well, no, wish you away. Uh, onto Montague Island, which is, as, as we say, a little uh, little island off the Cumbria coast, um, mm -hmm. but was made famous or created even by Mike Craven, in the curator. Um, so that's where the idea came for that. So, um, as I say, it's Montague Island books, and you get to take seven books with you of your choice as well as a full set of um, the Tilly and Poe books by Mike Graven, an imaginary set of them as well. So what's the first book that you'd like to take with you? Uh, Fahrenheit 451 by Ray Bradbury. So, uh, And what, what's your reasoning behind that one? Um, I love Ray Bradbury. I mean, I've got an undying love of dystopian fiction. It's what I studied at Union. It's what I kind of hope to write uh, myself one day. Um, and yeah, Fahrenheit 451 is just a uh, I think it's a timeless novel. You know, I read it for the first time when I was kind of in my early twenties, and I and I've read it a couple of times since. And and even though it was written kind of in the fifties, you know, it still feels very very apt today. And 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 I just think that the the messages it, that it kind of delivers in terms of um, you know that because it's because it's all about censorship and the kind of the restriction of information and 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 the lead character guy montague is a fireman but the firemen um, don't actually put out fires they start fires and basically their job is to go to people's houses if they have books and they burn books because books are illegal to own and it's about a story it's it's the story of his fall from 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 perceived kind of grace really and how he comes to see what he's doing is not um actually you know, he's not actually a good guy, he's a bad guy kind of thing, and he kind of comes to terms with that. And I just think it's a really great story, and it's not very long, and it's phenomenally written. Um, from well, that uh, was written in the 50s. What was it based? Uh, it was based in the 70s, I think. But it, but it, 
but based in the based in the seventies with a very kind of futuristic outlook. So they talk about kind of wall sized televisions and interactive you know media and headphones and and like you know that kind of thing. It's just all very futuristic. But it's, you know he calls them seashells, but it's actually just like a like a little headphone radio kind of thing, like Bluetooth. So it's. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't. Know, I, I like. I like old books that imagine the future. So it's always, uh, yeah. Always when you can, when when you're actually in the future and you can, so to speak, and you can see which, which bits of it were right and which weren't, it's uh, yeah. makes it even more uh, puts another twist on it, doesn't it? Oh, well, that's yeah. great. So, what's your second book going to be? Um, Tarzan of the Apes by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Mm. Um, which was the first real book I read on my own when I was a kid. So. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I grew up, I, I would kind of watch the, the Disney uh, kind of adaption of it, you know, the cartoon when I was when I was a kid. And I don't know, I just kind of like, I really wanted to read the book. And, and my parents were like, oh, yeah, okay, well, you know, just read it. Didn't really know a lot about it. <laughs> they got it for me and it's pretty brutal and pretty dark. So I was like a kid reading. I was like, oh, my God, you know, <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is crazy. It's like a real adult book, you know, so it's, uh, and I don't know, I just read it a couple of times since. And, um, and I've, you know, given it to a couple of people as well. And I just think, I don't know, it's a, it's one that just sticks with me and it's uh yeah. it's a great story you know it's a story of kind of adversity and love and you know it's uh yeah, yeah. a rollicking read as well that's it and it's great when you get a book but just stays with you through your life isn't it and you can pick it up anytime and read it and you, mm. you know it just gives you that buzzing all over again doesn't it mm. and what's your third book going to be today uh dracula by bram stoker Ooh. So um, I, st I read this for the first time when I was in uni and um, I was blown away by, uh, by the format of it. I've ne I'd never read um, uh, an epistolary novel before and an epistolary novel is one that, not novel, novel is one that's um, kind of comprised of, of letters and telegrams and yeah. diary entries and that kind of thing. And it's just, you know, Bram Stoker was a, was a science fiction author himself and kind of his foray into um into kind of dark fantasy i suppose was was just i don't know i just really love the way that it's kind of put together and i wanted to choose seven books that, that were all kind of completely distinct from each other and for me that was just a, a great example of the form and and i mean it's the original vampire novel i mean it's like it's the you know it's just every you only need to say the word don't you dracula and just everybody everybody's got their own picture of it it's, it's just one yeah. of those that you know, you don't need to mm. even tell what the book's about. It's just yeah. mention that one word, Dracula, and it, you know, people get taken by it, don't they? You know, so that's great. But lovely <laughs> to see the different uh, different genres of books you're choosing as well. And um, what would your your fourth book be? Uh, Dark Matter by Blake Crouch. So he's a science fiction author again who wrote the Wayward Pine series. Um, but I read Dark Matter just on kind of, on a whim, really. It was just kind of emailed to me by Amazon. It was like, oh, I'll read Dark Matter by Blake Crouch based on your kind of thing. So I read the kind of the, the blurb, which was very vague and and it, it was brand new out. So I took a punt on it and I read it in kind of, I don't know, a day and a half flat. And it was just, it was the first book that I'd done that with for about five years. And I was just like, okay, this is kind of, this stayed with me but it taught me a lot about writing as well and it was just one of those books I just could not put down and 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 it's just a wonderfully complex story that just unravels and just comes apart at the seams and just gets more and more kind of wacky and weird and complex and and starts off just as the story of a you know of a, of a scientist who is sort of is just contemplating whether he made some some kind of sound life decisions and then just suddenly <laughs> he's trying to outrun a horde of kind of interdimensional copies of himself and it's just it's just wacky and weird and wonderful but it's it's a book that you a can't the mad scientist <laughs> yeah it is so it's brilliant well definitely different i'll give you that and um, what's your uh what we all know fifth book uh what's your yeah what's your fifth book going to be um sword of destiny by andres Sapkowski. so this was um the second um novel in the witcher series which is a kind of um a fantasy series uh, he's a polish author but it's a collection of short stories but they're kind of quite long short stories but it's just a um again you know it's a it's a series that i'm that i've read kind of back to front two three times now and you know seven seven books in it and played the game and and kind of very very in love with the, with the world and the way that he builds it the sword of destiny is just uh it's it's just great because he takes off some old kind of um 
some old fairy tales and things as well and there's kind of um, a really good twist on on like um the beauty and the beast kind of fairy tale as well and uh, but you sort of rewrite them in injecting kind of polish law and polish fantasy into it and there's heart the the kind of you know the hero is this very grouchy kind of monster hunter and he's and it's just everything you want from a fantasy novel you know it's like immortal beautiful sorceresses and and you know and, and a you know a mutated monster hunter and swords and and you know the the writing is you know in polish is supposed to be very good but it's translated by a guy called david david french and um and he's uh he's he's a very good writer as well i don't know i've never read anything of his actual books but he's a good translator so i gotta give him that great wonderful so another another good fantasy book there. and what's your next book uh, number six is Wool by Hugh Howey. So this is a this is an actual dystopian novel, um, and it's set in uh, the the future where uh, nuclear holocaust has sort of laid waste to the world, and everybody lives in silos. And silos are kind of skyscrapers sunk down into the ground, and um, <clears throat> and every month they basically um send somebody outside they dress them up in like a space suit and they send somebody outside and and everybody watches on big screens as these people kind of toddle off into the distance and then they fall down dead from kind of you know radiation exposure kind of thing and um and they keep doing this every month to see whether or not the radiation levels yeah. have dropped enough for people to survive and it's just about it's the story of a kind of a young mechanic who stumbles into a situation where she comes across some information she shouldn't have and then it's about how the political kind of unrest sort of unwinds and and kind of uh, the the situation that turns on her and there's three books in the series and they kind of take place across you know hundreds of years but they go back to when it started and how they built it and it's just a real masterful kind of um sort of story of interwoven kind of narratives that that kind of transcend time and, and kind of don't play with time lin linearly and it's it's the book that inspired me to write um my kind of my big first big dystopian kind of novel which has been in the works now for like a couple of years but it's still a book that I kind of go back to and read for inspiration so I think that that's a good one and that's one I've given to a bunch of people as well so I always think that's a mark of a good book. Great wonderful yeah I like that so with a, with a few fantasy and a few dystopia and what have you so you've got a good mixture there and what is your seventh and final book? The seventh and final book is Never Let Me Go by Kazuo Ishiguro. So it's, um, it's he's a Nobel uh, Prize winning uh, author. He's Japanese uh, and just writes fantastic prose. And uh, and it's a really again, it's a it's a really wonderful story of kind of a retrospective story set sort of with in in a kind of fictional nineteen nineties British setting. And and kind of tells a woman tells the story of her life growing up in um, Hailsham Private School and. And it's just a recount of all these sort of um, kind of coming of age, normal childhood kind of experiences and teenage experiences. But but it's set against this back, this very kind of dark and dystopian backdrop that in the present. So it's kind of you always know that there's this dark element at work in the background. And, and it's just really wonderfully juxtaposed, you know, that kind of that normality and that kind of, um, you know, unnormality. Eight, I don't know. What's the difference? What's the opposite of normality? Somebody will be screaming down the screen now. <laughs> yeah, probably down in the comments. We'll uh, we'll check it out later and kick ourselves for not knowing the word. Yeah, but uh, yeah, another another great book. So you certainly got quite a lot to keep you busy while you're on the island. And the, yeah, so with the <laughs> fact that it's sort of all sort of fantasy and you know and what have you, make just take yourself off yeah. whatever you want to, can't you? So many thanks for telling us about your seven books. So we're now on to, as I say, we on the on the island, on the imaginary island, you do get about an hour's electricity every day. Okay. So you're allowed to take one CD with you. So what, what you know, and that can be music or whatever you wish, but what would you choose to take with you? Uh, I take an album called Everything Goes Numb by a band called Streetlight Manifesto. They're a, um, an American ska band. And, uh, and I remember, I remember they, they were the first, like, so I was, I think I was like 12 or 13 when I first kind of heard the, heard the music, but, but up until then I had no real concept of kind of 
of, of my own taste in music. I would only ever listen to kind of, you know, what my brother listened to, or what my dad listened to, or what my friends listened to, and what was on the radio. And this was the first band that I was introduced to through a, through an internet forum for, for, for PlayStation games. Um, and somebody was talking about it and I looked it up on, on YouTube and I had no idea what YouTube was and I listened to it and it was not like anything I'd ever heard before and it was kind of chaotic and fast and, and brash and loud and exciting and I listened to it and it just really kind of spoke to me and nobody I know likes that music but for me it's it's the kind of the music that really awakened my ability to choose for myself what I enjoyed and, and even now I just listen to that kind of album again and again I know every word to every song and it's just a for me, the album that kind of defined my ability to choose my own taste in music, if that makes sense. So it's yeah, a definitely. sentimental album, I guess. Yeah, and it's a group of, I'm quite well into the music, which is a group I've never heard of, so I will have to go on the YouTube and check <laughs> and check definitely. them out. <laughs> and I've always, so that's great, something a bit different as well. And what about a DVD? What DVD would you take? That can be that can be sort of a TV series, a movie, a music, or, or whatever it might be. If it was going to be a, um, a, a film, I think Interstellar would probably be my choice. Um, just absolutely mind-bending science fiction with a you know it's, it's Christopher Nolan all over. Um, and TV show um, probably Californication um, with David Duchovny in it, and it's. Uh, yeah, it's about it's about a writer, you know, who's down on his luck, and uh, you know, he gets himself into all sorts of trouble, and it's just. I don't, <laughs> but it just does that ring a bell somewhere? <laughs> yeah, it does. There's just lofty aspirations there, I think. But uh, yeah, he does get himself into all sorts of trouble. So he's he's just you... about as cool as I think I could, you know, yeah. as I can ever hope. So I'll pin you down now. Will it be the TV series or will it be the film? Uh, I think it'll have to be the film. <laughs> just, just in case people are like, oh, he's, he's one of those who likes Californication. Yeah, <laughs> the stellar. <laughs> Oh, that's great. And what about a, a food or meal that you can that you can take with you? What would you uh, what would you choose for a food or meal? Uh, pizza. Pizza. Any particular pizza. one? Oh, pepperoni pizza. <laughs> so pepperoni. Lots, of, lots of pepperoni pizza. Yeah, mountain of it. I mean, it wouldn't wouldn't do my probably my stomach any good, but uh, yeah. Well, I mean, it, you're stuck in mind, you, know, you really got to kind of do other than just gorge yourself on pepperoni pizza. Right? Yeah, that's it. You just need a good pizza oven there, don't you? Just over yeah, the exactly. pizza oven. <laughs> that's great. So finally, you've got a luxury item which can be literally anything. So what would you uh, what would you interesting to know what you'd take as a luxury item? Um, or quil quilted toilet paper every day of the week. Uh, uh, I don't, I honestly, if you're going to get marooned on a desert island, I don't think there's anything else in the world I would rather have. I mean, you can keep your memory foam mattresses, you can keep your televisions. I'll, I'll take a big, big bit of toilet paper any day of the week. I love it. That's great. We've not had that one before. We've really? Had very, had some very strange ones like hair brushes and all sorts, but. Not add uh, not add quality toilet paper, but it is a good one because if you're stuck on a desert island and you need to go, then <laughs> the last thing you want to do is discover that the only thing around is aloe vera plants. You know, it's yeah, like yeah, definitely yeah. Family. Well, that was uh, that was a very interesting choice and one uh, one that I'm sure other people will probably use uh, now now as they thought about it. <laughs> so many thanks for going through all that and uh, say you're off on your off off on your way to the island now. And you've got Mike Craven's Italian Po books as well to uh, to keep you company. So you know that'll that'll keep you going for a while. So just before we finish, do you want to again to just give us a quick reminder about your current book and where where people can get it? Sure. Uh, so my current book is uh, Angel Maker. Angel Maker is the first novel in the Detective Inspector Jamie Johansson series, and it sees. Um, Detective Inspector Jamie Johansson drawn out of administrative leave and summoned back to her home city of Stockholm to capture the serial killer that her father was never able to call her. Um, and yeah, there's lots of harrowing, you know, situations that she gets herself into. And if you've ever read a Jamie Johansson novel, you'll know mm -hmm. that uh, she doesn't shy away from a challenge and she can sniff out trouble from a mile away. So definitely. Yeah. yeah, definitely. So it's definitely a way. character that's going to grow on people. Definitely. Hopefully yeah. so, yeah. That's my favourite thing about it, is that a couple of people have kind of 
messaged me saying like oh I didn't really like Jamie at the start I didn't really like Wick at the start but like by the end of it I, like they really grew on me and I'm like good that's that's what I wanted because she's mm-hmm selfish and she's not really nice but she doesn't give up and she's really <laughs> but that's one side of it but there's other sides to her as well but we'll let the readers uh, have a think about that one when 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 they're reading the book and just yeah. a final reminder of your website um and where they can get your books perfect so my books are all available on amazon on um paperback and kindle and uh, kindle unlimited and um the first book in the prequel trilogy, if you want to kind of, if you want to start at the beginning, is uh, available on Prime Reading until June third, I believe. And yeah, if you want to get in touch with me, you can do it on my Facebook page, Morgan Green Author, or on my website, uh, www.morgangreen.co.uk. And uh, I would love to hear from you because I really enjoy speaking to fans and uh, or to readers at least, and uh, and hearing kind of, you know, what they thought of my work, good or bad. Right. Well, thank you very, very much for coming tonight. We hope you enjoy your time on the island. Don't get too bored or too cold. Certainly not. <laughs> I'll see you again. Fun. Thanks very much, Daniel. Yep. Thank you very Cheers. much. Thank you again. Right? Bye bye. Okay.